Hello, uh, my name is Aubrey Hicks, and I am the Executive Director of the Bedrosian Center at the Price School of Public Policy. And today I'm really excited because Gary Painter joining me and Errol Southers have been working on a fantastically important project. Um, we are going to be talking about the NDSC, which is the Neighborhood Data <laughs> for social change, <laughs> the Neighborhood Data for Social Change Project um, on criminal justice data. Um, okay, so first, Gary, can you tell us a little bit about NDSC? Yes, and, and perhaps without wasting too much time, it's useful to know the history of Neighborhood Data for Social Change. It was about seven or eight years ago that Melody Winterhead, who was the community affairs officer at the Fed, had been talking to lots of folks around the community and convened actually a meeting of over 120 people to talk about what was missing in our neighbor, our data ecosystem. And, and at that moment, way before there was a Price Center for Social Innovation and you know, I, I was leading it, um, we were part of conversations as a, you know, basically representatives from the Price School and you know, UCLA was there and, and, and many neighborhood groups. And what people really recognized is that there wasn't a way for people who are working at the neighborhood level, like neighborhood councils or community organizers to get data that they could use to inform their work, to support their work and to drive their social change agendas. And so with that, we went and kind of embarked on a series of conversations over you know, the next really three years, uh, four years. To, and, and we finally made the decision that we wanted to launch this platform. And I think what makes it different is not just its ability to be user friendly and so that people can actually you know, get data from you know, 200 different sources you know, at the neighborhood level that they can construct themselves, mm -hmm. but it really is intended to be an engagement vehicle. Um, so on a monthly basis, we have data stories where community groups want to share their work. And what we do is we contextualize that work. Um, and you know, further when issues come up like the pandemic, we're able to kind of launch data at the neighborhood level that kind of can correlate risk factors like asthma and age and other conditions to the rate and prevalence of COVID in those particular neighborhoods so that we can provide timely data to people in their neighborhoods. But I think what's important and what really triggered this study more than anything else is that we listen based on comments and based on the training that we do to our communities and they tell us what data they want. And so one of the areas where they said, we need more data on public safety. Um, we're tired of just having data on the number of crimes in my neighborhood. That is not capturing to us what we mean about public safety. And so what that did is it triggered an impetus for us to reach out to potential funding partners. And we're really excited that there was a partnership available because Microsoft had launched a criminal justice initiative and so we were able to connect to them and kind of present them the opportunity in partnership with the Safe Community Institute and, and obviously under Errol's leadership to actually get this project going. And the important part there is that you've been listening to the communities. Um, and I think we'll come back to that as we talk about what um, public safety is. Um, so Errol, why did Safe Communities Institute uh, want to want to collaborate with social innovation. Well, again, I'm going to throw sunshine on Gary Center <laughs> to say it was a perfect opportunity for us. As you know, we focus on violence prevention, we focus on education, research, and community engagement. We walk on what I call the razor's edge because here we are dealing with communities that are disproportionately affected by law enforcement, and we actually have a several programs we educate law enforcement. So this was a chance for us to work on a project through Gary Center for Social Innovation, where we really could talk about data. And you've heard me say this before, W. Edwards Deming, I always say without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So I was supportive of, of Gary in saying, let's find out what the data really says. Let's find out what's going on. Let's have that conversation with people. So we could, and, and most importantly, it wasn't just about the academic rigor we were going to put into this. It was a chance for us. Anytime we have an opportunity to put the community, quote unquote, in the room with law enforcement, I'm on board. And when I realized that Gary had proposed to have neighborhood convenings, we've got a tremendous relationship with a number of law enforcement agencies in the county. We've got a great relationship with a number of community organizations. Anytime we can put them in the room together, that's a positive move for me. So we were on board from the word go. Or as they would say, he had me at hello. 
Well, so, you know, you listened to the community, but was there a, a tipping point that made you decide now we, we need to do this project? In some ways, um, I would say there wasn't a tipping point um, in the sense that there are many times that the community elevate a data need, a desire, et cetera, to us. And so we work hard to try to identify a, a partnership, a pathway, a way to move forward and to get funding to move a project forward. And sometimes it, it, we just don't, don't find that. So in many ways, what we were able to do, what was great about this project is that we not only had a funding partner, Microsoft, that was interested in this work, but we actually had an expert, you know, here at the Price School um, who could actually really contribute from his substantive expertise and the work of the Safe Community Institute. So it just seemed like it was a terrific time or point in time to really launch this forward. Of course, um, issues around law enforcement, public safety, et cetera, you know, have been with us. Um, and in the last decades, it continues, we continue to be confronted with issues of disproportionality, especially around um, arrests and stops of the black population. And, and so it remained important to bring data and light to light so that we could actually inform various kinds of reform efforts. Of course, um, we couldn't have anticipated what happened this year when we began the project. And so in my view, the work of the, this project and while we're sharing the year one results, it really does point a light that we need to kind of fast forward and accelerate the work that we're doing so that we can actually inform those reform efforts that, that are before us. Okay. Errol, did you wanna add anything? No, no, Gary sums it up very nicely, thank you. Okay. So before we get too much into the, your findings, I wanna ask, what was the hardest part of the project? Well, I think in, in some ways, you know, they, the challenge was set before us in our conversations with the, the groups that we serve with Neighborhood Data for Social Change. And they said, we want to know more about public safety. So what we what we wanted them to do, and then, then I think to like, then were what data are going to inform that? Because we sort of knew going in that it wasn't just going to be about you know, FBI crime stats, right? And so we, I imagine that they might be asking for data that just simply weren't gonna be available. Um, so we embarked on our first major convening. We actually hosted it at USC. We had law enforcement officials from USC, it's police department. Um, we had, you know, LAPD. We had, you know, police representatives from very small cities like El Monte. We had community organizers from all throughout the region. We had individuals representing themselves just to come to this convening of over 120 people to really talk about and dissect what public safety was and is. And so that was the first critical step. The, the next step would be then, well, what kind of data do we think we can bring to the community that would actually inform the conversation of public safety in ways that we had not seen before? So um, I'll sit, sh share more about that later. Mm -hmm. I would say the most challenging part about it was the fact that contrary to popular belief, law enforcement agencies track everything, mm -hmm. everything, believe me. So my real question when we went into this was, what do you want? Okay. Because they know. The other part to that was, what are they going to going to share? So that's where our relationship with organizations and agencies became absolutely critical. I mean, I know CompStat. I remember when it got stood up. We knew the commander there, and they all pulled back the curtain. There were agencies who didn't want to do that. And so we had a very, very small number of participants in this study because of that. Understand how the game is played. You know, if you have a budget and gang crime goes down, a city council member might say, well, geez, you don't need as much money next year because gang crime went down. No, you say to city council, I need more money because I can drive it down even further. Mm -hmm. So there's an interesting game to play with statistics. And what I really want to applaud LAPD for is the fact that this data pulled back the curtain on the number of extraordinary stops that happened to people of color. Right. And they were willing to share that because that's the truth but you have to know what to ask for. And then what does that mean? So we had a really difficult task of knowing what are we going to ask for? What are we going to highlight? What are we going to look at as this examination took place? Okay, so 
I want to go back to that redefining of public safety. Mm -hmm. um, so you had this convening a lot of people with a lot of different backgrounds. What, what were the surprises, you know, in terms of what people defined public safety as? Were there surprises? So Oh, there, there were, I think, in terms of the prevalence or lack of prevalence of criminality being the most important kind of set of metrics. So kind of how many crimes in my neighborhood as how people led with the public safety. So we had a, used a variety of different tools to collect this information. Um, in our report, we have a nice word cloud that kind of gives you a sense of the words that people were saying. And if you look at those words, you'll realize that you know, it's probably somewhere in the range of a third um, actually mentioned things that we would typically think of as how many crimes are being committed and so forth. There's we'll the nice, um, We'll go ahead and put that in there. Yes, and, and the largest word is community. So public right. safety, they said, what I think of as community, what I think of as engagement, what I think of is a place where I can walk my dog, I can push my stroller, it's well lit, there aren't signals of disorder, such as bulk trash items there, et cetera. Um, parks are clean, the, all of those kinds of things. And so for, for me in that sense, we then had to kind of take that next step and say, well, if public safety for two thirds of people aren't necessarily criminality, it's part of it, but it's not like what they're leading with, then what sorts of data ought we to, to look at? But before we go there, maybe Errol could also just share his own thoughts on that. No, actually you've captured it very well. I'll just say it confirmed something I had seen almost 15 years before in another city when we were working on a gang prevention unit and we asked people that very question, what is public safety? And we thought they would say more gang officers, more police officers, more units. They said just the opposite. They said, we'd like to see lights in the alleyway. We'd like to see crosswalks at the intersections. We'd like to make sure the trash is picked up. So it confirmed what I had already experienced previously where people were talking about quality of life issues mm -hmm. and not necessarily equating security or policing with their public notion of public safety. And how interesting that as you're finding this, you know, you're proving this, the, the community is then asking for it, not just here in Los Angeles, but all across the country and even globally, um, this sort of wanting to redefine what public safety is and thinking about how we're spending money. So um, you alluded to talking about the data. So what did you decide? What data did you decide on? Yeah, so ultimately, yeah, so ultimately we decided on trying to drill down on this idea of engagement and trying to get a sense of data that would tell us something about resident demand for engagement and also kind of how police from their side were engaging in the communities that um, they were serving. And um, I remember that early on in the project, uh, Errol and I were having a conversation and he noted that you can imagine that a, an opportunity of a law enforcement officer and, and a resident get together and that could signal an incredibly positive thing because that could be an opportunity for providing support and help. It also could be a very negative thing if there was harassment or arrest on issues that had perhaps unrelated to a in, a, in a in the case of an innocent person, mm -hmm. right, would would actually scar them for for quite a long time. And so just knowing something about the fact that engagements occur is is ultimately going to be insufficient. Okay. But we actually do need to track how many engagements are happening and the kind of origin of those engagements as a critical first step. So, you know, we kind of ran those ideas by our stakeholders um, to see if that resonated with them. We also recognize, you know, what data can we get? Can are we not going to be able to get? And we turn and turned out that for only one of our partners, LAPD, were we able to get the depth of data that we wanted to for this particular set of, of indicators. So, so that's what we ended up going forward with. Okay. Harold, do you have anything to add about data collection or? No, I just want to again reemphasize Gary's the conversation that I had with Gary about the interaction, um, you know, to one person, the interaction is profiling to another person. The interaction is an, is a conversation, right? And it's just a matter of how it all takes place in terms of context. Yeah. Um, I think the the interesting word that I've been hearing, um, over the last couple months is having police think of, um, their community as their neighbors. Um, mm -hmm. 
And here in LA, it, it's hard for a lot of officers to think of the community that they cover as their neighbors because they don't necessarily live in the area. But thinking about it in terms of, of interaction with, you know, between the stakeholders, you know, is, I think, such a, an interesting and important first step and um, kind of sad that <laughs> it's a first step now, um, not for you guys, but just for in general. Um, that we haven't been sort of sharing this data. Um, and that's what makes this, this so exciting. Um, so you've collected the data. What are your key takeaways? Well, the first swath- Is that speeding up? Do you wanna, do you wanna go something between the, the data collection and takeaways? Uh, no, well, let me just start and then we, Errol and I can kind of go back and forth. Um, you know, so when we first looked at the data, we just said, okay, we just I, we identified two indicators we were going to dig deep on. We first put them up. Um, one of them was how often do si uh, residents call for service from law enforcement? And the other one was how many times do police initiate contacts? You know, so both of them are about engagement from a, but from a different source. So we thought that would be pretty instructive. So when you looked at those data, what we actually saw was that from 2010 to 2017, that police initiated contacts overall in LAPD were going down. Yeah. Uh, there was a small tick up in 2017, but the overall trend was going down. So I found that, you know, interesting. And then the overall trend in citizens, residents reaching out to law enforcement was going up. Um, and so kind of when you saw those raw data, I thought, well, actually, that's quite interesting, perhaps, you know, incredibly positive, because you have a world where you would actually want less policing on issues that could be considered profiling harassment and so forth. Um, and if overall policing, police initiated contacts are going down, that's a good thing. And if citizens are reaching out to law enforcement, that could potentially be signaling and I think we still interpret it this way as a desire for engagement and, and also perhaps signal trust that was happening. So on the first pass, you know, the data actually were, were quite positive in, in ways that I hadn't fully appreciated. You just don't know for sure what was going on, but it really pointed out that overall police initiated contacts were down. The, we had some very interesting conversations throughout the course of the study. And I had to caution my colleagues with regards to the stops. And I wasn't defending LAPD, but I was trying to explain some of the numbers. I said, understand something. Metropolitan Division doesn't get sent to Bel Air. They get sent to areas where, according to CompStat, the crimes are extraordinarily high. It's mm -hmm. a suppression unit. Right. And they're not going there to do anything other than suppress. Mm -hmm. And so understand that that uptick in stops and arrests are going to show on our data, but understand that that's a unit that's being sent there to do exactly that. So it's a very fine line you walk on with regards to, we've got this computerized analysis of crime in the city. We see this one area where it's extraordinarily high. Do we not respond or do we treat it like, I should say, should we treat it like the rest of the city or should we send more officers there in hopes that it'll go down. And so you have to be very careful, even though our study proved what we thought would happen anyway. What I wanted to know was how many of those stops were being engaged by specialized units. Mm -hmm. There's a difference in having patrol units do it and having Metro do it or, or some other unit that's sent there specifically for presence. And understand, Metro's a presence, that's what it is. Hopefully when people see more visibility, less things will happen, less bad things will happen. And, and so it's something that we were never able to really zero in on with regards to separating that out, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, it certainly doesn't explain the extraordinarily number of high stops on people of color um, as compared to the rest of the city. If, if there's no other reason for that, unless in other words, what I'm saying is if there's no crime indicator to suggest we, we had a lot more cops there, then that just shows it's pure profiling. And just to emphasize that point that uh, Errol has made, you know, that it wasn't in my, you know, it started off as, you know, a lot of what I would say is initially potentially positive news, 
Um, but then when we kind of did kind of pull back the veil on police initiated stops, that there was, you know, distinct patterns. And one of the patterns he highlighted, which is that if you were covered by the Metro PD division, you know, including areas like South LA and so forth, you saw actually an increase in stops, much more, many more stops um, relative to other places. So that was one level of disproportionate policing, but it, of course, as Errol said, it could be completely intentional, completely expected, and that perhaps we shouldn't you know, worry about that as it relates to policing. Um, but the part that is disturbing is the fact that no matter what neighborhood you were looking at, so whether you were looking at Bel Air, you were looking in South LA, you were looking in East LA, what we found continuously is that Black people were stopped at higher rates than white or or Latinx populations. And this, you know, the fact that it was happening everywhere and the disproportionality was everywhere was, was very disturbing. Um, and then forces us to, to look in the mirror collectively and, and how we're policing in these communities to, to understand why that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and even in a time when overall stops are going down, why is that still happening? Um, and so that's, a question for us to all reflect on and, and act on. And if, if I could just follow up on Gary's comment, what was even more disturbing, even though I know it because I've experienced it, were our stakeholders in the study expressed the harmful psychological impacts of profiling. I mean, you know, Gary and I have had this conversation before, we've been interviewed before, and there's a big difference in my daughter getting stopped by the police and someone else's daughter getting stopped by the police who's just going to feel like they just have to pull over, tell them what they were doing, and they're going to go home. Mm -hmm. you, you know, and, and, and that came through in our convenings with the community that the psychological impact, it's almost like, like I don't want to call it PTSD, but it's extremely traumatic Yeah, as it relates to, you know, people say, oh, it's just a police officer behind me. No, that's not what a person of color thinks when they see those lights go on. So I want to go back to um, the specialized units. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, um, can analyzing this data sort of identify some feedback loops? So, you know, you're not going to um, find crime where the police officers are not, right? So um, can we look at some of these feedback loops through this data, or do we need more information to, to identify some of that? You know, unfortunately, Aubrey, policing, and this is something if we want to talk, I hate to use this term, but I'm going to use it because it's the term of the month, reimagining. Um, if we're really going to reimagine law enforcement, we need to build law enforcement on a different metric. Right. Law enforcement is built on a negative metric. Right. It's built on arrests. It's built on field interview cards. It's built on, it's built on stops. It's not built on progressive actions like having a conversation, the things that we talked about. Mm -hmm. So as long as you have that, our data is going to drive us toward crime. Mm -hmm. The response from a policing agency is suppression, which increases your stops, which increases your detentions. And as Gary mentioned, interestingly enough, crime or not, increases our detentions and stops of people of color. Right. So it's going to be really... And, you know, in our next study, perhaps we can we can tease that out, but that's that's going to be really difficult um, to do. Yeah, I think what what's necessary and I don't know if we're going to be able to identify it in the data is to note policing policy changes that had happened over time so that you can tease out whether those policy changes, those approaches actually can causally impact the, the number of stops in a particular place. Um, it's very difficult, and even your question implies there are feedback loops. Therefore, if we just look at the raw data, we can't actually conclude that a particular set of policing practices are suppressing crime and or causing greater numbers of stops. And so that is a, a critical next step. There's certainly been studies outside of LA and other contexts that have looked at particular policy changes, but, but that would be something that we would need to be able to identify. And sometimes it's obvious that there's a policy change. Um, sometimes it's not. Um, you know, I think many of our, 
our listeners may have, uh, you know, watched The Wire season three um, and, and certainly know of the term New Amsterdam. And, and, and it was one of those great contexts, right, of understanding where, you know, there were a lot of people in the community and or in the mayor's office that didn't really know what was happening um, with the data and so forth, because there was a, a, a more private policing practice change than a public one. So it does pre present real challenges for the research community to identify those causal mechanisms, but we certainly are aware of the fact that you could end up with feedback loops like these. Right, and in terms of policies, there's also the difference between, you know, an official policy and then the norms of the uh, department. Okay. Um, so I think we might have already covered this, but you know, in the in your takeaways, was there anything that um, surprised you, or you know, is it just what you expected? Well, I think that you know, part of the surprise I'd mentioned earlier was just how people define public safety in such a prevalent way outside of of criminality and crime stats that are quite typical. So to me, that that means that if we're we are reimagining what public safety ought to be, what our, our, our fire department ought to be focused on, our police department ought to be focused on, that we actually have to have a different target in mind. And I think Errol has also mentioned that. So, so I think the study helps support those reform efforts, um, both within law enforcement and then within the broader community for how we should deploy such really scarce and highly trained resources um, for a variety of things that in many cases, as we know, aren't necessarily within their, within their training. Right. Um, I think the other piece that I was actually surprised at, given some of the tension, given some of the over-policing in certain communities and the disproportionality among Black people, is that we also looked across neighborhoods and calls for service were going up everywhere. And, and so to that end, it wasn't that community was resisting law enforcement, um, but they, some, they actually were engaging and wanted higher levels of public safety. So we have this on the demand side, it seems like people are looking for a, 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 a more engaged, a more healthy community um, as it relates to public safety. Um, at the same time, we know that certain communities are, are quite fearful of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And even in those communities, the, the calls were going on. That's right. So. The pleasant surprise for me was exactly what Gary's takeaway was, was that there was still a demand in the community for policing. Now, here's where I segue to my second part. How many of those calls necessarily required a stranger with a weapon? Right. You know, as I've said before, you know, America is a 911 society. You know, whether it's the person that's knocking, you know, having a fight or the person whose car got wet because the neighbor's sprinkler got on it, not police. And right. so I'm back to my notion of triaging those calls and sending the right people, you know, you know smaller, as Gary mentioned, we were talking earlier today, smaller communities have done that. I mean, I was at Santa Monica almost three decades ago mm -hmm. and community services officers went to calls that had reports or, or non injury, traffic accidents. Parking checkers went for those kinds of calls that dealt with vehicles. Animal control officers went when the cat got in the tree. Mm -hmm. They didn't call the police for everything. And so right. I'd be curious to find out in what we found in our study for that increase in calls, is 911 a reflex? Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Yeah. And you know, in other cities, they clearly have a non-emergency line mm -hmm. and an emergency line. And, and when everything has to go to the emergency line, it gives you this skewed data that suggests everything, that the place is on fire and it may not be. Right. And um, that's been a, a large part of the conversation this summer. Um, and I was thinking about it in terms of uh, how the community is defining public safety. So the more they feel that they are safe and they are part of the community, likely the less they would feel the need to dial 911. Um, uh, so I think it's a really interesting thing to think about and how we can collect different data in the future too. Yeah. Um, so 
to go back to um, sort of specifically Los Angeles, what do you hope that um, the Angelino community that sort of broadly uh, can do with this data? Well, I think that it also, you know, as all researchers, you know, when you have some data, it signals the need for more research, more, more oh, analysis and more data and so forth. Um, but it also, you know, you have to generate support to take those next steps. You know, so one of the critical next steps um, that we're going to be looking at this year is what were those calls for service? As Errol pointed out, if it is the case that there are clear patterns of emergency and non-emergency calls, you know, and we can actually kind of look at if, you know, am I calling because I see a homeless person sleeping on a bench? And then that necessitates a 911 call um, versus when you actually see a crime being committed in the neighborhood. And, and of course, we're not going to be able to disentangle the data to all possible different sources of calls for service. But I think by going deep there, I think we're going to provide even more information about, again, this demand for public safety, this demand for interactions with law enforcement or emergency services or, or services broadly, and to be able to help target where they ought to be um, sent um, and, and who should be responding and, and those kinds of things. Rather than right now, as we know in LA, you know, the, the city just kind of took a hundred and, you know, was it $150 million and said, okay, well, we're going to take it away from police and put it into services, right? But right now, I don't think we have a good sense of what is the right allocation, right? And so there was a number chosen, a reallocation happened, but what to what, mm -hmm. right? And so I think we do need more data to point that out. Um, I, I think that's one critical issue. I'll let you go, Errol, and then I'll have some other thoughts too. Well, I have two things top of mind. Um, to, I want to tag on to Gary's last comment about the $150 million. I would think that a more academic way to do this would be a peer-reviewed assessment of the department to determine what they need and what's the appropriate reduction. Maybe it's $250 million. Maybe it's $50 million. Um, but who determined that, that percentage and where did it come from? That's my first thing. Mm -hmm. But Aubrey, to answer your question, I'm going to be a little bit more aggressive here. I'm concerned about biased policing. I mean, that's why we're having mm -hmm. these discussions. Right. Mm -hmm. And what, with all due respect to our study finding three and four times as many Black and Latin Angelinos being stopped. Regardless of neighborhood. Regardless, in the last three years, LAPD fielded 1,742 complaints of biased policing. And you go, wow. Well, that sounds interesting until you find out that zero of those complaints were sustained. Zero. Yeah. Now, I got to tell you, having been in three departments, everybody who has a negative contact with a law enforcement officer of those that go the length to make a formal complaint, I have no data to back this up, but I'll just say on a good day, it's probably about one out of 10. Mm -hmm. You had 1,742. Out of all of those, you're telling me none of your officers were ever found in a complaint that was sustained that they really did exercise some bias? That doesn't engender legitimacy and trust with the community. And so I'm gonna push and say, all right, now we know what the numbers are in our study. Mm -hmm. Your own complaint data supports that. What are you doing different so that doesn't happen? Right. Especially after this summer. Right. So I can tell you, you know, what we're doing, we have our first, I'll call it convening. I like Gary's term that his center uses uh, with the law enforcement agency in two weeks. Um, and interestingly enough, they wanted to do it live and in color. So we went out to one of our faith-based partners. We're going to host it in the first AME church. We're gonna be socially distanced. And I have uh, an expert on de-escalation and mediation and empathy and respect. And they're gonna spend some time in a non-police course on that to see if in fact it will help. And we're not letting them get away. Every month they check in with us, we wanna know. What happened to you in the last month? Did this training prove to be valuable? What kinds of things did you encounter where you didn't know what to do? And we're going to start working on that because, you know, I got to tell you, policy, with all due respect, when it comes to law enforcement, police department culture eats policy for breakfast. 
This is a culture we're dealing with here. And our numbers show that regardless of whether they're in Metro division or not. And so I'm gonna be a lot more aggressive with regards to remedies to some of the data that we came up with. And Errol, I think it makes sense. Uh, I'll just ask you to explain for those that are watching on video, you have Lewis behind you and you know, you're know you continuing to actually do work that inter directly intersects these findings. Um, maybe, maybe you could share a little bit about how that work intersects with what we found here. Absolutely. We're standing up the Lewis Registry. We named it after John Lewis, of course. Uh, the acronym stands for Law Enforcement Work Inquiry System. It'll be a national registry of officers that have been fired because of misconduct. What I'll share with you is that, again, I've got LAPD data at hand. Last year, 58 officers resigned or retired or left the department before they got disciplined. Where are they now? Mm -hmm. And so what we're, we're standing up now is at least for officers who be have been fired, and I can tell you it's extremely difficult to fire a police officer. A quarter of them are always reinstated, sometimes months or years later with back pay. It's important now going forward that these officers that are fired are not able to bounce to another department. And by the way, California is one of five states that if you get fired, your certification stays intact for another three years. And there are agencies out there that are advertising, if you've been fired, come here. So we need to stop that. Um, if I can, anecdotally, there's an officer in New Jersey who's 31 years old. He's on his ninth department. He was even let go by Camden, the city who <laughs> went, took their department away. They yeah. got rid of him. The only reason you don't know who he is is because he hasn't killed anybody yet. That shouldn't be. Right. And so that's what we're doing with Lewis. We're gonna be partnering with a whole lot of folks. You'll hear more about it coming soon, but we're making tremendous progress. And we hope to again, like get to partner with Gary Center on collecting data to find out are there trends and patterns with these officers so we can reduce the risk of them getting into this category where they are deemed to be needed to be terminated. Um, this is a sort of technical question, but are there, um limits to how you can um, correlate the data to the people, <laughs> you know, so the data that you're looking at in terms of interactions and the data that you're looking at and um, the specific officers. I yeah. assume that there are some um, limits with the officer's bill of rights and then Absolutely. also probably um, just ethical. So unfortunately we'll only know public information. What I would love to have in a perfect world you know, years of service, what watch did they work? Were they on a special detail? Um, those all play in. I mean, if we find out that an officer who's three to five years on, who's on a special detail, who works morning watch, we call that a clue in police work. And we would know. I mean, I can tell you there was a time when we knew most officer involved shootings were officers that were on between, you know, three to five years. What happens in those three to five years where they wind up in more officer involved shootings? So, and the other thing I'll, I'll say, and then I'll get off my soapbox, um, when we talk about some of the tragic incidents we've had over, the, over, over years now as it relates to um, people of color being killed by police, I'm always curious as to why they rarely involve female officers. Because female officers arrest and fight as many people as anybody else does. But why are they not in those instances where deadly force is used? There's another study that needs to be done. Lots of more studies, which is great because you've got lots of things to do, right? Um, so who should read the actual report? Well, I think that we absolutely are targeting people who are, have decision-making authority, both within police departments and also in the broader civic infrastructure, because we want them to understand that there is this higher demand in communities for public safety broadly defined around engagement, around, you know, kind of a, that sense of belonging um, and, and people looking out for each other and not just around crime stats. And so that, I think that impacts all city departments and, and as I noted, the civic infrastructure that's out there. I think we also, you know, for those people who are representatives of their community or just, you know, kind of talking about themselves who are engaged, we want to be able to arm them with information that can allow them to advocate on their behalf. And that's really, again, back to the theme of what Neighborhood Data for Social Change is all about. 
And so when we have a request and people say, I want more public safety data and we give it to them, then they can actually go to people, go to funders, go to others to actually affect the change that they wanna see. So, so those are at least two of the audiences. I would just echo what Gary mentioned because you know, with all due respect, this project is just a slice of a larger pie that he has at the Center for Social Innovation as it relates to employment, health, housing, all those other things play into it. This is just the public safety component. But if we have all of those other components as well, it helps the community inform their decisions on how to go forward and strategize for a better quality of life. Yes. Um, so I wanna wrap up um, with uh, each of you thinking about um, the last few months, your year of work on this project, um, particularly the last few months in the, in the uprising and the constant media. Um, uh, there's a huge Twitter thread that um, starts with the cops, the police are rioting um, and all of the different video evidence from um, the summer of uprising. So taking sort of what we've lived through, What's one thing from this project that you learned that you want to either move forward with or that we could learn to pave a way forward? You wanna go first, Daryl? Sure. Um, I'm gonna piggyback on something you said earlier. In spite of all of that, there is still a desire of the community to engage with their law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. We've got to take advantage of that. We've got to build that bridge. We, on the other hand, as the sheriff who was at George Floyd's memorial so eloquently said, he said, we have to say the six words in terms of law enforcement, we are part of the problem. And I think we need to take advantage of, as, as Gary did with, with his center and allowing us to work with him, convenings, those convenings were incredibly impactful, very productive, very effective, you know, with all due respect, most people don't ever sit in a room with law enforcement ever. They just don't. I mean, the only time they ever have contact with them is either going to make a report at the station or getting stopped on the street. This was a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I know we're all finished talking, but I think this can lead to, lead to some real action in terms of making some changes and doing some things together to develop those solutions. So I just want to rephrase that as um, one of the things that you're seeing is that the community wants law enforcement to be a part of that community. Yes, they, they are. They are truly the problem, part of the problem. They have to be part of the solution. And then I would just say, I agree 100% with what Errol said there. I think that we actually have to in our policy, in our procedures, in our practices, as it relates to law enforcement and other formal agencies, we actually have to reframe exactly what public safety is and have it align with how the community defines public safety. Otherwise, you're never gonna hit the mark. You're gonna continue to miss that, you know, like really what we're, we're trying to achieve. And, and I don't think that our study provides any evidence that you shouldn't have law enforcement as part of helping the community hit that mark. It actually reinforces that to some extent because we saw calls for service continuing to increase in a time when police were actually overall stopping less people. So, so to that end, you know, you can see that there's a little bit of a dichotomy, but I, I don't view it that way. I, I view it as more a mismatch between what people want with public safety and what they're actually, what we're tend to measure and what, you know, potentially police and law enforcement more broadly are thinking about um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's what I hope this study helps reframe is those more formal institutions to recognize really clearly what public safety is all about. And if you can then have a North Star to guide you toward that, then you can end up with the outcome that I think that we all want. Okay, um, anything you want to add that we haven't touched on? Did I miss something? 
you know, I guess it's standby for the next years. I mean, I think there is a lot of additional work to be done here. Um, and we hope to partner with more and more law enforcement agencies. There are particular kinds of questions that are important across different systems. So one that I care deeply about is, is, is how we can end homelessness in LA County mm-hmm. specifically, but more broadly too across the country. And, and one of the, the issues that comes up repeatedly with the homeless is that they've had interactions with the criminal justice system broadly, with police specifically, either before or after they're experiencing homelessness. And so I actually want to know what's happening um, in calls for service with the homeless, I want to know what's happening after people have been potentially arrested or incarcerated and then have become homeless and understand more about that pathway, um, which we know from the research is a critical risk factor for people experiencing homelessness. Um, Those are just two quick things that come to mind. And I think these data are going to be able to help shine lights on that. But there's so many other kinds of data that we could bring to bear working with more agencies um, in, in order to really get a, a real deep picture of and broad picture of, of what public safety is all about here in LA County. Do you envision uh, working with different agencies to have them collect specific data? Well, I think at first um, we, we just want agencies to be able to share their data in a way that <laughs> we can collectively understand that we're going to treat them as partners in the enterprise. We're not going to be a gotcha kind of academic, you know, institution. Um, You know, we, in this, every round of this report was reviewed by LAPD. Um, And, you know, the conversations that were had with community groups that were quite angry um, with the results that they saw, but weren't surprised by because in communities of color, they kind of knew what was happening. And, and, and to see the data actually is, is challenging to wrestle with, right? Yeah. Um, but I think that we can, we've shown that by walking with law enforcement and the community in partnership, we actually can achieve the outcome we want. Um, and I'm hoping that more law enforcement agencies are going to be able to partner with the efforts of Neighborhood Data for Social Change and also the Safe Communities Initiative. Um. Okay, so one more thing that I want to do is um, just for a clip, I'd like to um, have both of you talk about um, what public safety is. Okay. Who wants to go first? Sure, I'll just, you know, public safety is a whole of community quality of life concept, and it should not be equated with security or policing. Mm -hmm. And we found that out in our study. It, it actually confirmed what we thought to be true when we had neighborhood convenings and asked them, what's your definition of public safety? It was very, very enlightening. And that there is overlap between law enforcement definition and community definition. Um, and that's where we need to focus, right? Absolutely, absolutely. But how, about, how about you, Gary? Yeah, I guess I define public safety based on the research that we've done as being in a community where there is a sense of trust so that when people are engaging with each other, they trust each other. So they feel safe with each other. There's an absence of fear in that engagement and that there is a trust and an engagement that is a positive at a positive in a positive way with more formal structures, whether they be law enforcement or other government agencies. And so it really speaks to kind of how people live their lives that they actually feel like this, they're having positive experiences in living their lives. Um, Just a a slightly side note, apart from the definition, you can cut it out later or not, but um, you know, when you interview people, what are the three things they care about most in terms of choosing their neighborhood and what do they want? Um, they will repeatedly mention three things. They want to be able to have access to a quality job so they can provide for their families. They want to be able to send their kids to high quality schools and they want to feel safe. Um, Those three dominate all other factors as people are choosing where to live and what they really want in their lives. And so I think understanding that definition of what it means to be safe which means to be that they trust the people that they're engaging with, the the fellow residents, they trust the formal structures, that there is that system of trust going going on really can signal to why it's so important to have high levels of public safety because it really generates wellness within people's lives and within their communities. 
that's perfect. I think that'll make a really good book. So, um, okay. Uh, thank you both, Gary and Errol, for joining us today. Um, this is a great project. I'm really excited about um, how the community uh, learns from it and then going forward, um, all of the different uh, avenues that you can go. So, thank you. Thank you for thank having you. us, Aubrey. Pleasure.